And now, please welcome my friend, Pastor John, as he finishes the series on Mark 12. Let's give him a hand clap. Good morning, New Life Church. Oh, hey, when I preach, I love to start with just some common ground, establishing some level of agreement with the audience before things might get a little chippy. So uh, can we all agree, go Vikings, Vikings win today, amen? Yeah? No? No? Andre, we got the, we got the majority, bro. All right. I know you don't all agree with me on that, so some of you didn't even know that football begins today, so that's fine. Let, let, me, let me try something else, a little heavier than, than football. So here's a question for you. Have you ever looked around our world, or would we agree that when we look around our world, we don't have to look very far to find corruption in our society today? Do you agree? Is that a real thing? Is this mic on? Is it, or do y'all think we live in a, a land of just, you know, great things going on? Like, there's a lot of corruption, and I would contend it's in places that we were taught we should be able to trust Institutions of like our government and media and education and our justice system, things that we should be able to lean into and expect truth and fairness and honesty and integrity. Uh, we don't have to look far to find that there's a lot of corruption that runs deep into those places. Do you agree? Okay, I'm not leaving till we agree because I know that it's true. And I don't know if, if it's if you're like me, but I have often found myself praying that God would expose that corruption, that he would bring it to light and that he would condemn it and that he would bring justice where there is not justice. I know the day's coming that everyone will stand before God and give an account for their life and there will be a day of reckoning, but I want that day now. Like I want it to happen in my lifetime. Do you ever pray that way? I do, and I name names, and I'm like, Lord, you can start with this person, and then that institution, and I wonder, though, like, as, as I'm opening the scripture this week and reading for our final verses in Mark chapter 12 as we finish up this series, what do you think would happen if Jesus were walking the planet this year? Like, if he were here right now, do you think Jesus would be leading a charge against the FBI and the media and the White House and the Supreme Court and all of that, do you think Jesus would be on the front lines of exposing the corruption and bringing it to light and, and pointing it out? Do you think that would happen? I've come to the conclusion that it wouldn't. Because over 2,000 years ago when Jesus did walk this planet, there was plenty of corruption in all of those institutions then as well. And we don't have much account of Jesus exposing that or speaking to it. And it's not that he doesn't see it or that he doesn't care. But today, what we're going to see is, and this is consistent throughout the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when we see Jesus put some people in the crosshairs of his scope and expose and condemn and speak words of judgment, do you want to know who is in the center of that scope, who Jesus directs his harshest words towards? It's religious people. It's almost as if Jesus cares more about cleaning up things in his own house than he does about going out into the world and cleaning up corruption there. It's almost as though Jesus has a greater concern that the people who claim the name of God and claim to know God and follow God and believe in God, that they are actually smoking what they're selling rather than he's concerned about going out into the world of people who don't want God in their life, who don't believe in God, who don't claim his name, who don't desire to follow him and, and worry about cleaning up their life. It's almost as if he's focused more on his house. That's what we're going to hear in the message today because as we turn to Mark chapter 12 and we're going to read the final verses in this chapter, we're going to hear Jesus give a warning, not against the White House or the FBI or the government or the media or the educational system. We're going to hear Jesus warn people about the religious leaders. And he's got some strong things to say about them. So there's two different kind of stories. We're going to read the, the rest of the verses in Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 38. But I'm going to divide them up into two different segments. And then, then they, they might feel kind of disconnected at first, but we'll connect the dots because there's a theme 
that I think beautifully connects them. So stick with me. We're going to go through this together. Verse 38, let's start here. It says, as Jesus taught, he said, watch out. Everybody say, watch out. Watch out for who? Watch out for the teachers of the law. Why? They like. Now listen, I, I noticed this word like, and it's interesting to me. It's like, this is, a, this is an emotional word. They like something. This is something they enjoy. This is behavior that they prefer. They prefer to do these behaviors that Jesus is getting ready to expose. These religious leaders, they like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Look what he says next. These men will be punished most severely. More than the political party that you disdain. More than the media channel that you call your favorite versus the other channel that you hate. He isn't calling that out. He's saying these types of religious leaders with this religious spirit, they, they're going to be judged most severely for the corruption and that's what I want to talk about here in just a few minutes is this idea of a religious spirit because some of you may have heard that scripture and go, well, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not a religious Pharisee or Sadducee. I'm not, I didn't live back in this day, so I don't walk around in flowing robes and desire the seats of honor in the synagogues and all this. But I want to just go back through that a little more slowly because I think there's some elements of a religious spirit that are alive and well in God's house today, and you don't have to be a leader for this to be true of you. So let's, let's go back through this list. The flowing robes. These people like to walk around in flowing robes. Understand this. This is not a, a statement of fashion, like what they chose to put on when they left the house this morning. There's an intentional, I'm going to use the word, it's a costume. It's what it is. They're putting on an external costume that is for the benefit of everyone else who looks at it because through these robes that they wore, and there was a lot of symbolism in, in the robes that they wore, but it was very showy. I want, I want to stand out in a crowd based on the way I'm dressed because the way I'm dressed is telling everybody else it's an external sign that hopefully they will believe there's something internal behind it. It's an external show of righteousness, even though what Jesus is saying is there's no substance of internal righteousness at all. It's all for show on the outside. A religious spirit is more concerned with external appearances than inward substance of truth. And, and so Jesus is saying, don't be impressed by their Gucci robes or whatever they got going on. Like that's, it's, They're just doing it for show. He said they like to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. These were men who were all about their title. And they would prefer you address them by their title. You ever met that guy in the church? I have. I am Dr. So-and-so. You can refer to me as Bishop So-and-so, Elder So-and-so, and we get all caught up in our titles. One of the weirdest days of my life is when my church that I grew up in started calling me Pastor John. That was weird. Because when I was born, my parents just named me John. And for years, that's all people called me. Well, they called me some other things too. But John was pretty much what I went by my whole life. And then all of a sudden, overnight, after one business meeting, when I'm hired by my church, now it's, hey, Pastor John, hey, Pastor John. I'm still not used to it all these years later. And by the way, I don't mean any, like, Call me Pastor John if you'd like. I understand many of us were taught to say those titles and address with respect, and I get that. Um, but, but man, be careful if you strongly desire a title. What's really weird, if I can just go on a little side note that has nothing to do with this, but it's like when people just call me the first part of it and leave John off, hey, Pastor, I, I'm going to mess with someone someday and just be like, what's up, farmer? what's up high school english teacher what's up stay at home mom like why are you calling me by my my job my job function right like i get it but it, it also if we're not careful it can go into some weird places and i've met those people they want the title because it's it's a praise of man it's it's a praise from other people yeah come on with the title give me a title it says they want the most important seats in the synagogues What's the synagogue? It's where they, they, the physical location where they gathered for worship. So in our modern day 
context, we would say it's in the church. The, a religious spirit wants the most important seed in the church. Have you, you can raise your hand to this. Did y'all, any of you grow up in and around a church that had the special chairs up on the stage for the pastors to sit in? I grew up with that. And, and I want to be careful. I don't want to sound critical because, again, maybe, maybe there's a, a reason for it. I don't know. But I look at it, and it's like, why does, why does the pastor or a few pastors get a little mini pew up here while everyone else gets the big pews out there? Like, even if they're not talking, like, well, you get to sit up here. Like, that's weird. And if we're not careful, that can take us to some, some unhealthy places of, I want that seat. I want to sit there. And I want to just offer a quick word of balance here. I want to balance this out because Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he said, if anybody, he said, hey, Timothy, here's a trustworthy saying. He said, if anybody desires to be an overseer, that's where we would get the English word bishop. It's someone with some authority, a leadership role in the church. If someone desires that, Paul says they desire a noble task. So here's what I want you to know. It's okay to desire a place of spiritual influence and authority in the church. It's okay. It's not bad to want that, but there's a way to get it. And the way to get it is through faithful, humble service where you're willing to serve in God's house behind the scenes in an obscure role. The religious spirit says, I don't want obscurity. I don't want service. I want the stage. I want the lights. I want to be up where people hear my voice and they get to see my gifts on display for all to see. Those people make me really nervous and I've met them a lot over the years in the church. They want here without serving out there first. And I'll tell you, I, I say this next thing as I'm thinking about my story this week and kind of how did I get here? I don't say this to put my life on a pedestal, and I'm certainly not suggesting that your story needs to be identical to mine. But I'm like, first of all, I can tell you this. This is God's honest truth. I never wanted to be here. <laughs> How's that for inspiration? Right? I, don't, I don't really want to be here this morning, right? I didn't desire this. I grew up in a pastor's home and had a good experience in that, but I saw how the sausage was made, and I was like, God, I'm good doing anything else. Like, I don't want this. So it, it always makes me a little nervous when I meet someone, and you're like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And they're like, I want to be a pastor. Like, I don't know that word means what you think it means. <laughs> like, I, I'm going to try and convince you to do anything else. I say a little jokingly, I, I want to follow somebody who tried getting out of the gig, right? Like, God, they finally surrendered. I want to see a little bit of a fight and resistance than someone going, I crave that spot. I want the role. And that's just me. That's not thus says the Lord. That's my opinion. But I didn't want this role. So I'm like, how did I get here? When I think back over my life, here's, here's a really important distinction I want you to hear. So I grew up in a pastor's home. Church was not optional. But I was never forced to go to church. I would have been if I put up a resistance, but I went willingly. And at an early age, I want you to hear this, I learned to love God's house and God's people. Not because my dad was a pastor, not because I had to go, but I can remember as I started to enter into my early, like, junior high years, like, I, we, we lived, like, two doors away from the church. So I could have, as soon as church is done, like, peace out, I'm going home, I could have left I could have snuck out. My parents were both busy. I could have left. They wouldn't have known. My brother did a few times, I think. Mom, if you're watching, he did. I know he did. So <laughs> what I found was I actually enjoyed sticking around in God's house with God's people. And then at a pretty young age, I got involved in serving in all kinds of different ways in the church. I served in the little toddler nursery, roughhousing with three- and four-year-old boys, right? I, I, I worked in our junior church as a volunteer. I worked in our youth group. I served in all kinds of capacities. One story that came to my mind this week that kind of drives this home a little bit is uh, there was a season in my life where I served as our, the maintenance guy for our church. You know, I'm just a part-time gig fixing stuff that gets broke and whatever. And one time, I think it was one of my brothers got married or a friend, but anyway, I was a part of a wedding party on a Saturday and we had the whole rented tux thing. Do they still rent tux? Is that a tuxedo? Is that a thing still? Silly, but we did, and, and, and we dressed up for church, suits and ties, so I was like, well, here's a really fancy suit and tie. I'm going to wear a tuxedo to church on Sunday morning. So dumb. But anyway, I wore a tuxedo to church, and uh, I'm the maintenance guy, and so someone comes up to me in the lobby, and they're like, John, someone just destroyed the toilet in that bathroom back behind the stage. 
it's not flushing, you know, you're the maintenance guy. So like I have this visual in my mind of John in a tuxedo with his plunger doing his thing. Nobody sees it. No one's celebrating. It ain't sexy. I mean, I look nice, but it, it's not sexy work. And then even when I finally surrendered to what I sensed was a growing call of God on my life to preach, I was terrified. And even when I said yes, the roles they gave me were not this. I have preached in some very not sexy places like nursing homes. Like, hey, John, we need someone to, it's our turn to preach at the nursing home service. You want to talk about humility, preach to a bunch of people that are sleeping before you've even gotten out of the introduction. Like, one time, true story, we're sitting there preaching away, and there's a gal, and I'm sure she was in late stages of dementia, so I'm not very mad at her, but she was sitting in an ice machine, throwing ice on the floor as I'm talking, preaching. And then out of nowhere, she kind of fell asleep and then just wakes up as I'm preaching the gospel and says, that's the biggest bunch of bull I've ever heard. And I'm like, you can roll yourself right out of here, Gladys. I'm not doing this. But it ain't sexy. So it's okay to desire to get to a place of influence and authority, but the way to get there is faithful service in God's house and being willing to serve in some obscure roles behind the scenes because God develops some stuff in us in those times. So let's keep going. They want places of honor at the banquets. This is interesting. In Jewish, Jewish culture, there was a thing. Like anytime there was a formal feast or a banquet, they would have kind of like what we would have at a modern day wedding where you have the table of honor, the head table, whatever we call that. They, they would do that and they would put people in seats according to their level of importance to the host or whatever. And so these religious people, they want those seats of honor. Jesus even spoke to this in Luke 14. He said, if you're in one of those settings, don't go plunk yourself down at the seat of honor. Like move further down the table and put yourself in that place where the host will come and say, hey, friend, come. You, you, this seat is for you up here. You don't want to be in that seat and have the host come and say, hey, uh, bro, that ain't for you. You need to move down a few seats. Jesus said in, in Luke 14, if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. And if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. And so these guys want that seat because here's the distinction you need to realize. A religious spirit thinks that leadership is equivalent to privilege. That if I get to be in a place of leadership, if I can be on the stage, if I can be in charge of something, if I get to be the boss, I'm a, I am in a place of privilege. I get to tell people what to do. Uh, they get to give things to me. I get stuff from them. And what they fail to realize is that true spiritual leadership is a responsibility and it's a burden. Not like a nasty burden, but it's still a burden. To, to now, I'm responsible to care for people and to lead people and to love people. So be careful what you ask for, for those who say, I want that seat of honor. I want, it's not privilege. It's responsibility. He says, this is a, this is a really incredible charge that he levels at them. He said, they devour widows' houses. And what he's talking about is they're using their position of spiritual authority or their spiritual office as a way to take from the, the least among them, from those among them who are least able to give. We're not, we're not talking about faithful giving to the Lord, and we're going to talk about that more in a minute. This is not what that's referencing. This is referencing someone who is manipulating and abusing their position of power to extract from people to their harm. Do we still see this in the church today? 100% we do, to the point that it's turned not only many Christians off, it's turned much of the world off to the gospel message because they see these people, and I'm not lumping every person that has a, a, a presence on television or whatever. I'm not putting them all in this bucket. But certainly there are some worthy of what I'm about to say. They have earned this reputation of, I have this massive platform, and I use this platform to tell people on limited budgets and fixed incomes to sow their seed of faith, and with that seed of faith that they're sowing, I'm flying around the world in private jets and buying multiple mansions and, and living this extravagant lifestyle while they go without. It's still alive and well, and the world sees that and says they're all that way. Jesus had some pretty harsh words for a religious spirit that devours the houses of widows. And then he goes on to say, for show, they make lengthy prayers. 
the, the Pharisees of Jesus' day were known to be windbags. Man, like you didn't want to ask a Pharisee to pray for food before lunch, right? Because they're going to pray not to pour their heart out in worship to God. They're going to pray to impress you, the audience. So they're going to pray these long, flowing prayers. Have you ever met that guy? You know his name? I do. I could name a bunch of them over the years that you're in church or whatever and it's time for lunch and it's like, hey, Bill, will you pray and bless the food? And Bill, who up to this point has been a normal person speaking English to you, all of a sudden becomes Shakespeare. And he's like, dear heavenly Father, we do thank thee for how thou hast poured out thine blessings upon thou as people. And it's like, Bill, we, the food's getting cold. Will you tell Jesus thank you and let us get to eating? But see, in that moment, a religious spirit, Bill's not worshiping God. He's trying to impress you with how well he can pray. And it causes younger Christians, new believers, to go, I don't know how to pray. Don't worry, you don't have to pray like Bill. He's faking it. Just talk to the Lord. And if you're about to eat, just tell him thank you for the food. We're grateful. And start eating, right? Amen. But this isn't just about prayer. I want to I speak to something that I see alive and well in the church today, in our modern church. So often, by the way, we, we put two words together as the same thing. We put worship and music together as though music is worship exclusively. Now hear me clearly. Worship is, music is worship. Like, right? Our worship can be expressed through song and through music. 100% absolutely yes. But worship is so much more far-reaching than just music. A lot of times people will use the words interchangeably. I'm not mad about that, but here's what does annoy me. is sometimes in the church, I've been in settings where people want to basically judge an external form of worship and say, because of how I see you worshiping or not worshiping, um, it tells me something about your heart before the Lord. And I'm like, eh, be careful with that. Be careful with that. You don't know my heart. You don't know the heart of the person who outwardly looks like God owns everything in their life. Have you seen their social media? I'm just saying. Like, we can't base it all on external things, right? Like, it's not for show. If you're worshiping, your worship is directed to God. And by the way, why are you watching how I'm worshiping, right? Aren't you focused on Jesus? Why are you focusing on me in this moment? Here's the warning. Jesus said, don't follow leaders like this and don't emulate their behavior. So when I'm sitting here praying for God to expose corruption, he's like, oh, I will. Let's start with the church. Don't follow leaders with a religious spirit like this and don't imitate their behavior. And remember what he said. They're going to be punished most severely. So let me go full circle back to where I started. When I'm scrolling through TikTok and seeing all the modern geopolitical current events of our day and I'm praying for God to pour out his judgment, he's like, I'm not nearly as upset about that as I am about a religious spirit in my house. That's what I want to expose. So we'll let those chips land where they may, but now let's move on to the last few verses in uh, Mark chapter 12. Kind of a different little story here, but they're, they're connected, so watch this. Jesus, it says, verse 41, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents calling his disciples to him so this this something teachable is happening or a teachable moment where jesus is like hey guys gather around listen 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 calling his disciples to him jesus said truly i tell you this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others and i just have to pause here for just a moment i've got to believe that his disciples, who did not really understand much of the time what Jesus was saying and teaching, and they didn't get the big picture even remotely, that it, and if I'm one of them, in that moment, I'm sitting here going, Jesus, like, I have seen you bring dead people back to life. I've seen you take a small amount of food and multiply it, and you've done some really cool things. I've seen you go nose to nose with the religious establishment, and that was pretty cool, but Jesus, I don't think you're very good at math. You don't count very good, Jesus. But see, Jesus said, they gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in how much, church? Everything. All that she had to live on. 
In just a moment, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward, and I'm going to challenge you to give every last penny that is in your bank account. No, I'm totally joking. Some of you are like, I told you! That's what they do when you go to church. I knew it! I knew they were one of those churches. I knew it! That's not where we're going with this. Let me, let me point out a couple things I see here, though, that's interesting. First of all, Jesus is sitting there watching people put their money in the offering. That's awkward, isn't it? Jesus can make a situation awkward. He really can. He can mess up a party. Jesus is sitting there watching the offering and watching people drop their money in the offering box. Talk about pressure. Whew. Would you believe me if I told you that Jesus still sees everything you do with the money that he's entrusted to you? It's his money, by the way. Always has been. It belongs to him. He put it into your care for you to manage for his glory. You're just a steward. It's not yours. And if you're mad at me right now for being the guy to tell you that, all that is is Jesus said your treasure is where your heart, where your treasure is or your heart will be also. And all that's showing is that you love your money a little bit more than you love Jesus, all right? Don't be mad at me. I don't write the news. I just report it, okay? So Jesus, he sees. He sees your priorities. He knows what your credit card statement says. That, by the way, if you want to know what your priorities are, just go look. That, that's what it is. He sees it. We also see in this passage that the rich people are putting in large amounts of money. That makes sense to me, right? I expect rich people to put in large amounts of money, right? You agree with me? The rich. Those rich people. We, we hear that in our culture all the time, don't we? Those rich people need to pay their fair share. We do, don't we? Do we hear people say that? All the time. It, it, sometimes we say it a little more subtly. Sometimes it sounds like this. If I ever become rich, then I'll give. Lord, you know I'm good for it. If you just help this jackpot lotto thing happen for me this week, you know I'll give then, Lord. He's like, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. I see what you're doing with the money I've already entrusted for you to manage. You're not giving now, so I don't really have any reason to believe you're going to be the lucky winner this week in the lottery. But see, we expect that out of rich people. If I was rich, I would give more. Rich people should pay their fair share. We expect rich people to put in big gifts. Can I share something with you this morning, church? You ready for some good news? You ready? Are you? You're rich. You're rich. Interesting. Same reaction as the first service. I thought, if, if you ever announced to a group of people, you are rich, that you would have people like, yeah, we're rich. We're running up and down the aisle. I'm rich, baby. I'm rich. And the reason none of you are responding that way is because you don't believe it. Because when we look at the socioeconomic ladder, there's only one direction that we usually look, and that's up. And so when we look up the socioeconomic ladder, we do see people above us a few rungs that have things that we don't have and so we we base our definition of rich on that gap that exists between us and the top of the ladder but church if i could just challenge you for a minute if you were to look down the socioeconomic ladder what you would realize very quickly is that you are this close to the top that you and i every single person in the sound of my voice right now you are in the top 5% of the richest people who have ever lived in all of human history. We're rich. I still don't think you believe that, but I want to see what the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. He has something to say to the rich people, those evil rich people. Verse 17, he says, hey, Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world, that's all of us, this is for us, not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth. So it's good right now in a season where our 401ks are 201ks that we don't put our hope in that, right? Don't put your hope in wealth because it's so uncertain. But to put their hope in who? In God, who richly provides us with how much, church? Everything for our What? Enjoyment. Sometimes when pastors preach about money, they make it sound like you should be miserable if you have some. No, you shouldn't. We serve a God who richly provides everything for our survival. No, for our enjoyment. God is not upset if you have some stuff. God is not upset if you have a level of 
financial security in your life. I would contend if you follow biblical principles of how to manage money, you're going to have margin. You're going to have wealth. And God's not mad about it. He actually is okay if you enjoy it, but it says command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be what, church? Generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Amen. So when we see Jesus pointing out this giving of this little little old gal who's giving the last two coins that she has and he's like that is a bigger gift than these rich people putting in their large amounts it's not that jesus can't count or that he's bad at math the lesson is that jesus is measuring the size of the sacrifice more than the size of the gift he sees the heart behind the worship he sees the heart and here's where i'm going to connect the dots Because we have these two kind of different stories. We hear this warning about religious leaders who are using their power and their position and the authority that comes with that to get stuff from people. And then we see, on the other hand, this little widow who comes in and she gives it all. She gives everything that she has. Even though it's not much, it's a 100% sacrifice. And I want to just back up a quick moment. In Mark chapter 12, we won't go look at the verses, but we've already covered them in this series One time Jesus was asked by a religious leader, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? They wanted to know what's the most important law of all the laws, including the ones that we've added to the books. What is the most important one? And Jesus says, it's really simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength. And then Jesus goes on to say there's a second one and it's so closely related to the first one that I'm gonna give you two for the price of one because also as you love God, the second one is you need to love other people like you love yourself. And he went on to say, you want to summarize all of scripture in one simple command? It's this, love God and love people. All of everything else hangs on these two commandments, love God and love people. So church, here's my question for you today. I want to ask, who is Jesus to you? And I want to ask, who is man to you? Who are people. When you look out on the sea of humanity, who is God and who are people? Because based on how you answer that question is going to really reveal some things about your heart. Because if your answer is, well, God is something, someone, some force, whatever, but it's some cosmic genie, cosmic slot machine that exists for my manipulation, for my pleasure, for my purposes. I use God, I use the church, I use faith, I use my spiritual influence to get to religious spirit. And by the way, people, oh yeah, people are just resources. They are human resources to get me more of what I want. I use people to get what I want. See, a heart of faith that is about what I'm here to give recognizes that who is Jesus? He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is my Savior. He stood in the gap for me when I didn't deserve it at all. He laid down his life. He poured out his blood so that my sin could be forgiven. And he gave me grace when I didn't deserve it. And he gave me mercy. He withheld the punishment that I deserved. And as a result of him being who he is, I owe him everything. I owe him my life, my worship, my allegiance. Everything that I think is mine actually belongs to him. My money, my health, my marriage, my kids, my career, my dreams, my aspirations. It's all his. And who are people? They are souls, eternal souls created in the image of a holy God. And he loved them so much that he sent his son to die for them just as much as he died for me. So they are not human resources to be used for my own gain. They are souls whom Christ gave his life for and he's called me to serve. You see the difference? It really comes down to, is is this about something that is there for me to get or is this about a faith that I have that causes me to give? And I don't know where that lands with you today. The good news is I don't need to know. God knows he's here. The Holy Spirit is with us in this moment. He sees every bit of your heart. And I don't say that in a way of condemnation because when the Holy Spirit speaks, he doesn't speak the language of condemnation. 
He speaks a language of conviction. Turn, repent. See, condemnation is you're a terrible person. You're a horrible wife. You're a horrible husband. You're a terrible follower of Jesus. You're not a follower of Jesus. You're terrible. That's condemnation. That is the voice of your enemy. The Holy Spirit speaks in very specific conviction. I love you, and I'm calling you to repent about that attitude in your life. That behavior needs to change because I love you. It's coming from a very different place. So Holy Spirit, do what you need to do in this moment. Are we a people that has a faith that is about giving or a religion that is about getting? God in heaven, I'm grateful for this opportunity to stand here and share your word with your church this morning. Thank you for giving us this clear warning of what a religious spirit looks like and how ugly when that gets built into an institution, into a system, and it becomes just part of the church business of how we treat you and how we treat other people. Thank you for warning us. Thank you for giving us some very clear symptoms to look out for and say, don't follow that and don't be that. Don't imitate that. Lord, I thank you for the example that you called out. Like you stopped the show and we're like, hey, everyone, I want you to notice this little gal who walks in here and in obscurity without any pomp and circumstance, without any flowing robes, without any title of respect, she lays it all on the line and gives everything. Lord, help us to see that clear contrast of what you commend and what you condemn of what you celebrate and exalt and what you tear down and humble and humiliate. Holy Spirit, do whatever work needs to be done in this place and in the hearts of your people today. As we move into this upcoming season as a church, God, I pray that you would pour out your spirit in ways we have not seen up to this point in this story. But Lord, you're not gonna do it through prideful religious spirits. You're gonna do it through humble, faithful servants who love you and love others. So help us get it. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Guys, if- Thanks for tuning in to New Life Sermon Series Online. If you're blessed by these messages and are interested in helping spread the word of God to others, make an investment today. You can give at newlifechurchsf.org. If you have a story or a testimony to share, let us know on our website as well. We hope you have a blessed day and enjoy today's message by Pastor Alex.